I'm John Walters. I'm uh, Chief Operating Officer here at Hudson. Welcome to the Stern Policy Center. We are honored to host Senator Marco Rubio, one of America's most knowledgeable leaders on national security and international affairs. He will discuss the crisis of the Middle East with my colleague, Hudson Senior Fellow Michael Duran. Senator Rubio was elected to the United States Senate in 2010 after serving as Speaker of the Florida House of Representatives. He currently serves as the Senate's, in the Senate's Commerce, Small Business, and Intelligence Committees. As a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Rubio is a powerful advocate for the importance of American global leadership. He has traveled extensively throughout the Middle East and just returned from visits to Qatar, Iraq, and Turkey. He is here to tell us what he found and to help us understand the state of the Middle East today and the challenges ahead for the United States and our allies. President Reagan said, facts are stubborn things, warning us that rhetoric and wishes do not keep us safe. No man has, done, has more steadfastly and courageously set forth the dangers of America today and what we must do to confront them than Senator Rubio. Please join me in welcoming him and moderator Michael Duran. So I just start talking? Or? Yeah. Well, well thank sure. you for having me. I enjoy I appreciate it very much. And thank you for hosting me. And uh, obviously, this is the first trip I've taken since I came off the, the campaign trail in March. And uh, I think it comes at a really important time in our national debate. We were just briefly discussing it in the, in the conference room before I came out. So if you go back to the end of the Second World War, at the end of that terrible uh, conflict, uh, the United States was a major player, in fact, the driving force behind the establishment of an international order that included the IMF, the World Bank, obviously reinvigorating the United Nations, NATO, uh, and a series of informal alliances around the world that, for better or for worse, I believe, have driven 70, 80 years of incredible economic growth and the spread of democracy and freedom the war, and the avoidance of a third world war. It's one of the things no one ever talks about. We could have had a third world war, and these mechanisms, to some extent, help prevent them, help prevent that. But now we're having a debate in America, a broader debate about what, what is the purpose of this setup in the 21st century. And obviously there's a line of thinking that this whole international engagement on the part of the United States is a one-way street. That's one of the arguments you hear made. And I think you're seeing it in some other countries as well, but primarily here, that this is all a one-way street, this is all America does for the world, and we get nothing in return. And I don't necessarily disagree that sometimes our efforts on behalf of others is disproportionate to what we think is the return or the gratitude of others. But we also have to understand that uh, we have benefited from this arrangement economically, politically, geopolitically, even domestically. If you think back of what would have been, uh, what would Asia look like today if the United States had not been engaged in efforts to help Japan rebuild or in our patients, our strategic patients, and seeing South Korea go from being a poor country and a dictatorship to a vibrant democracy in one of the largest economies in the world, and by the way, a net donor to foreign aid. What would the world look like today if Japan had not uh, been able to progress and, be, and, and recover from the devastating losses it suffered during the Second World War, likewise in Europe, et cetera? The U.S. benefits from this. I mean, in the end, uh, the products we invent have to be sold somewhere. And if only 5% of the world's population, the American people, can afford to buy them, then we're really limited in how much we can grow our economy. Uh, these partnerships have helped us as well confront evil around the world. When you look at the coalitions we've been able to build to expel Saddam Hussein from Kuwait, uh, to take on the risks we have now with Daesh, with, with ISIS, these are the sorts of things that, uh, that, again, we've been able to rely on these arrangements. So, Obviously, no place in the world today receives more coverage with regards to these conflicts than the Middle East. And one of the fundamental questions that a lot of people have is, well, what role should we play there now? Uh, we've been involved there for the better part of a decade. Nothing ever seems to get better. Hatred towards this country, at least if you turn on the television, it seems anyway, is higher than it's ever been. Why don't we just leave and let everybody kill each other off? What is that our business and why do we care? And so for someone like me who believes that all things being equal, while it is true that there are certainly uh, consequences and complexities presented by our engagement, I still think that the world without American engagement is a world none of us wants to live in. And we are challenged in the 21st century not just to justify our continuing existence, but also to find ways to adjust it, to modernize, to learn from our mistakes, and, but ultimately to make the fundamental argument that if we are not engaged in the world, the price we pay will be much higher in the long run than the price we pay to be engaged. 
And in that realm, that was one of the reasons behind this visit, is to see what role America is playing in a number of different places, but particularly in Iraq, Syria, and in that growing conflict. And they're multifaceted. We all read about the war against ISIS. We can talk about that. But embedded in that is the cause of why this happened to begin with. And the reason why an ISIS or ISIS-like groups will continue to bedevil the world in that region is the political instability that exists in both Syria and in Iraq. In the case of Syria, there's really the fundamental question of whether that will ever be a unitary country again. Bashar al-Assad has his hands just soaked in blood. And I can just tell you firsthand, having spoken to people that were impacted by that, there is no way that these people will ever be governed by him again. And uh, ISIS could be wiped out tomorrow. They will join up with the next group that comes around to get rid of them. Because when someone basically levels your city into rubble, uh, kills your father, your mother, your children, destroys your life, forces you to flee, there is no way you're ever going to accept that person's legitimacy ever again. Of course, embedded in Syria is also all the uh, uh, surrogate players that are involved in a geopolitical chess game, whether it's Russia or Iran and its affiliates. In the case of Iraq, it has similar, this is a country that's long been divided along lines, uh, Kurds, Shia, Sunni, and then of course Christians and other religious minorities caught in the middle as they are in Syria as well. And it too has seen this sort of sectarianism invade its politics for a very long time uh, and also further complicates what comes after. For even if ISIS is defeated, all these fundamental problems are still there. So it's a mistake to think we can go in and solve them all. Right? We can draft a constitution for them and tell them this is how it's going to be and you're going to do it. That's not the way it'll work. These, I don't anticipate either of these countries is going to look like New Zealand any time uh, in the near 30 or 40 years. But I do think we have an interest in what happens. Because what we do know is this. Whenever there are vacuums of instability created, particularly in that part of the world, that vacuum is filled by radicals. And those radicals almost always, irrespective of what we are doing or not doing, almost always try to target America either for their own prestige, for ideological reasons, or both. And so uh, I'm more than I look forward to talking to you in depth about some of the things we saw and some of the ways forward, and, and to do so in the context of the most fascinating election in modern American history. <laughs> uh, well, uh, thank you for that. Before we talk about the Middle East, I wonder if I could just start with a personal question. Um, Elliot Abrams, who I worked for in the White House, once told me that um, he was asked to brief you on uh, on the Middle East back when you were uh, still in the state legislature in, in Florida. Um, and he said that uh, after, uh, you know, after giving you an hour briefing, he realized that you actually didn't need it at all. Uh, and so um, I think many of us regard you as the most articulate spokesman today for a kind of conservative internationalism. Um, and clearly, this is something that came to you early uh, and, and that you're a natural at. So I just would like to ask you a personal question about why is that? What is it in your background that makes all this sort of your first language? Because uh, I grew up in Miami. <laughs> no, I mean, I say that for two. What I think we all have natural interests, right? People just, you know, why do, why do people, you know, like video games or whatever? I mean, I have nat natural interests, and it's, it's fascinating to me that uh, international relations is a fascinating topic. Number two, I happen to believe it is the single most important thing the federal government does. Um, I think it's one of the fundamental reasons why we have a federal government. And the third is, I do think my upbringing in Miami has a deep influence on it. Miami is probably one of the few cities in the United States where, um, where international relations is domestic policy, um, whether it's primarily focused on the Western Hemisphere, but not solely. I mean, there's a deep interest in what happens in the Middle East. Uh, there's an interest in what happens in other – we have a lot of international visitors that come through there. So we're impacted. Uh, by um, what happens around the world. And Miami is always seems to be at the epicenter of debates. Uh, as I said, largely about Cuba, not just Cuba, Nicaragua, Honduras, Brazil, Venezuela now, um, and then beyond uh, in Europe as well oftentimes. So, so I think the combination of those things, kind of a natural interest, the belief that it's the most important thing the federal government does, and having grown up in a community where international politics has, prim has played a driving force in migration and in, the, and in the growth of a city and of its affairs, I think all of these things um, contributed to that. Why do you think that this, uh, our, uh, I say our because I, uh, when I hear you speak, I just find myself nodding my head. Why, why do you think our worldview, uh, this conservative internationalism, is um, 
um, is having such a hard time these days? Are we, uh, or at least I, it looks to me like it is. And first of all, do you agree with that? And, and if so, why? Well, I don't think by nature the American people are <coughs> instinctively internationalists. I think by and large they want to wake up in the morning, run their business, raise their family, go to work, enjoy their weekends. That's what people want to do. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. So you see many periods in our history where Americans are arguing, okay, enough is enough, let's focus on ourselves. I think you com combine that with some significant domestic challenges. So you have to think about it, and it's not just the daily or monthly economic numbers, right? You have a massive economic transformation, which is changing the nature of work and business, where many of the jobs that once sustained our middle class just don't pay enough anymore. They just don't. I told someone this morning, if my parents had come in 1996, instead of 1956, there's no way that a bartender and a maid would have the same standard of living today that they had in the 70s and 80s. The jobs don't pay enough in comparison to the cost of everything from housing to the new cost of the new economy. The new economy has changed the jobs, the skills that are rewarded, the way business is transacted. It is the industrial revolution happening every five years instead of every 50, and it's incredibly disruptive. You combine that with an economic meltdown in 2008, which really impacted people whose primary investment for the future was their homes and, and an ongoing kind of inability for wages to recover since that. And then they look around the world at all this chaos and uncertainty. And I think the natural instinct is to say, all this stuff just brings us grief. Let's just focus here at home. Let's bring it all. If we, let's just sell things to each other, do business with one another, and forget about everybody else. It is a very human and natural instinct. It just doesn't work. And so the challenge that we have is to explain to people how our worldview needs to be modernized to take into account these sentiments. But ultimately, how you perform. I don't think there's ever been a period in human history where international affairs has a bigger impact on our economy than it does today. So we, we need to do a better job of explaining to people how, how the problems of their daily life are connecting up to what we're seeing on our, on our TV screen. Yeah, and it's hard because it's, it's a lot easier to say, you know, let's walk away. It's a lot easier to say, for example, you know, let's not, why, why, do we give, why do we give all this money to NATO and these other people that we're protecting do not? And um, it's easier to say that than to explain what would happen if you didn't. And so that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. I just think it takes time. And, and, and quite frankly, to be fair, today's press that covers this process is not interested in covering any of that. They, the majority of what I'll say here today or any other day is covered by political reporters who are covering the horse race. What did he say to criticize the Republican nominee? What did he say to, not the broader issues that I'm trying to discuss, it's all covered through the lens of the political horse race. This is not a slight on political reporters, but when political reporters cover foreign affairs, not from a policy angle, but from a political angle, what is he angling for politically? So it's become harder than ever to have this conversation. Did you say something to criticize the Republican nominee? No, but I, I might before the end of this. But my point is, it's not the purpose of it. It's how I really feel, right? But that's how it'll be covered, you know? Creates distance from so-and-so. Because at the end, they're a business. They're trying to draw ratings. And I'll be frank, if you have a one-hour special on the importance of U.S. engagement in NATO, it's not going to have a lot of ratings. But if you have a one-hour special in which, you know, some more exciting things happen, it'll have ratings. So I understand that part of it. I do. But at the same time, it, it filters into this broader conversation. Foreign policy, I'll give you a great example. Foreign policy, political reporters love to say, are you a hawk or are you a dove? I don't even know what those terms mean anymore. Right. It depends. When it comes to Canada, I'm a dove. <laughs> when it comes to the Middle East, sometimes I'm more hawkish. But, but those, these are easy labels to put on someone, and it's, it makes it easier to cover the story from a political angle. But it doesn't do service to the nuance involved in issues such as this. When you see those big maple leaves that the Canadians have when they're in Europe, though, that does make you angry with them, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, one of the big controversies is in the NBA uh, playoffs, the Miami Heat are playing the uh, Toronto Raptors, and Dwayne Wade was shooting, uh, was warming up during the Canadian National Anthem the other day. He didn't do it on purpose, apparently. And, uh, and so there was a big kerfuffle about that. So last night, he, he actually mouthed all the words to the National Anthem of Canada. Pretty impressive. He, 40 hours, he learned it. So, uh. <laughs> so listen, uh, turning turn to the Middle East, so you've just gotten back from this, uh, uh, from this trip. Um, uh, you, did you, while you were there, did you meet with our troops? I did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think we have to take a step back. We debate policies. 
But the one thing we're very blessed, and I'd say it's not just about our troops, but about our foreign service officers and others. When we tell our people to do something, they're going to do it. You go and tell them, take on ISIS, they're going to take on ISIS, and they're going to do it within the constraints you present them. But within those constraints, they're going to get results for you. Now, policymakers may build constraints around what they're allowed to do or not allowed to do, but they will get results. I mean, there are ISIS fighters being wiped out and eliminated from the battlefield. There was another report of an airstrike that took out yet another top ISIS official um, Last week, I saw the open source report here today, and um, they're going to get results for you. So from a policy standpoint, um, whether it's the right decision or not is, is, is another debate, but, uh, but you're, I'm always amazed by the quality of people that serve our country in uniform and in the Foreign Service, by the way. And the morale is good? I, I would say so. I mean, these are not complainers by nature. Right. Uh, they're not people are going to... Uh, they're going to go around saying, we don't like what we're doing. I think they enjoy the job they have. It was rewarding for them. If they have any policy differences, they didn't open up. Um, a lot of curiosity about what's happening back in the States. They're watching television the same way as we all are and, and are curious about some of that. I wouldn't say there's poor morale, but, but, but certainly when it comes to the military, their inclination is to get the job done, and so they, would, I think, would like to have the ability to do more. Um, whether that's the right policy decision or not is debatable, but... But I, I wouldn't say morale is poor, but I certainly feel like people think, like, we're here to do a job, let us do our job. I think get a sense of that. Do you, do you think that they, they need to be given more? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, what depends what country we're talking about because, and what more means. Uh, I think in the context of taking on ISIS, uh, there are two separate areas that we discuss, right? And, and the, the, the first is in Iraq. And the fundamental challenges there involve working with local forces. And it's complex because you've got Shia militias that we will not work with, which in many cases are proxies of Iran. And then you have the Iraqi security forces who themselves uh, have sporadic pockets of performance. So in, in some areas they perform very well, in other areas not so much. Again, uh, and, and so we, we are assisting them in that effort. And, uh, but a lot of it ultimately depends on what they're willing to do on the ground. And so you'll have places where Iraqi security forces are actually pushing in and are making gains. And there are other areas where you can't get them to move. And so these are the sorts of things that, that ultimately handcuff us. I don't believe, and I've said this, that a massive U.S. ground force presence there is the right approach. I think locals would resist it. I still think you have the fundamental question of who's going to hold that territory once it's freed from ISIS. And, uh, and I think almost immediately after that is done, you will see sectarian conflicts emerge. Uh, and, and so you, um, I'm not sure that that's the right approach. Uh, in, in terms of the number of airstrikes, look, I think we have to understand that uh, our airstrikes are conducted under rules that try to limit destruction of property, loss of innocent life. And when you do that, it's going to be very, you're not going to have the massive numbers that you would in another engagement. Do I think they could do more, given more resources? Sure. I think they're limited by the resources that they have, and, and, and often by the rules of engagement as well. In, in Syria, it's more complicated. We don't necessarily have the same presence there. And uh, you have vast territories controlled by multiple different groups, from Free Syrian Army elements to YPG Kurdish elements to... I, of course, ISIS uh, to the Syrian Assad regime and, and its surrogates. So it is a, basically a proxy war embedded around the axle of a, res, a radical jihadist uh, effort. In, in Iraq, uh, the Abadi government uh, is, um, uh, is having some problems these days. I wonder uh, what your view is on that. It's the same problem they had from their inception. Um, I think part of it is a consequence of how terrible Maliki was. It's just really terrible terrible leader, really set the, really traumatized the country and, and drove even deeper the divisions that existed. If you go, I mean, there's a sense that after years of Sunni governance over a majority Shia, the Shias now took control and they want revenge, they want their due, and so the, 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 there's this real conflict that exists between that, uh, that continues to play out, as you saw the other day. And then even within these movements, within the Shia themselves, there's the divisions between those for example, that are uh, under the command of Soleimani and others who are more nationalist, like the Sadrists, who, who feel like, uh, uh, well, uh, that are more national in their view of the world um, and uh, nationalist in their view of the country. They don't necessarily want to see uh, Iranian domination of Iraq. And then you have the Sunnis, uh, who obviously feel um, under duress, going back to the Maliki days. And then you have the Kurds, who have flat out said, they, this is the time for independence. I mean, they're, they're never going to get... Um, 
they're never going to be represented in the government the way they want to. And one of the reasons why I think they struggled to get a quorum, I think they were supposed to try to meet today, yesterday, the 10th. Uh, they can't get Kurds and other legislators to come back to Baghdad because they fear for their security. So um, the challenges really are about whether the, the fundamental challenge is really at this point the replacing ministers with technocrats, not people that basically view each of these agencies as a way to line their pocket and the pocket of their supporters. And, um, and the tensions that exist within the Shias themselves is whether the pace of reform is moving fast enough or not. Um, and um, so this is uh, it's really complicated. It's like a Rubik's Cube. You get one side right, it throws the other sides off. Is there, uh, is there anything uh, that you think the United States should be doing that is not to, uh, uh, to put the cube together? Well, I think first and foremost, it starts with security. I mean, until, as long as you're facing the threat of ISIS, it not only gives an excuse to Iran and others to play in the country, although they don't need much of an excuse to do so, but it's really hard to carry anything else. You have massive territories that are still struggling. Mosul is still entirely controlled. Um, much of the northwestern part of the country is still in ISIS control. So I think the security element is the most important. There comes a point where we can be of assistance, but, but Iraq and Iraq's central government is going to have to make a decision about a way forward that allows all of its people to be represented. We haven't talked yet about the Iraqi, uh, about the Iraqi Christians, which I met with in Erbil, both the, the bishop of the Chaldean church and also the archbishop of the Assyrian church, and what happens to all of them, uh, uh, who, many of whom would like to return back to their to their homes, if those areas are liberated, who, who's going to uh, provide them the security and what role will they play in the political future of the country and so forth. So I know I'm not giving you a lot of answers because it's incredibly complex. I think there is a role we can play, but ultimately you've got to have some effort from the inside out that makes this happen. You know, the, the thing about the prime minister is a lot of people basically view him as a decent man who is kind of trying to do the right thing, but is kind of hamstrung by non-existent institutions, no political tradition, of rule of law, and some pretty dramatic fracture points in the country that uh, will take an extraordinary leader to try to bridge, if, if it's even possible. Should we be should we be doing more to compete with Iran um, uh, in uh, among the Shiites in uh, in in Iraq, or is that uh, a losing? Well, look, there's a significant component of Iraqi Shia that do not want Iran to run the country, um, and. And, uh, and I think that that is clear, uh, that there's – I'm not sure that the leading Shia voices in the country. I think the bigger problem is that some of the best armed and trained militias are under Soleimani's complete control, and they're not just going to put down their arms and go away. Right. They're going to want to roll in, an, in their own view. Um, and, and so I think that's one of the reasons why you see the administration stick strongly to this argument that everything we do has to be done through Baghdad, in essence, whether it's arming Kurds or providing more assistance to uh, – the popular mobilization militias that are not the Shia groups, it all has to be done through Baghdad. We don't want to do anything that, that weakens the central government for fear that a fracture could increase uh, Iran's uh, stature in the country. But, uh, but I, I do still believe that within Iraq there are significant elements of the population, if not the majority, that do not want to be an Iranian puppet. And, uh, but I, I do think if we were to pull out completely and just say let it go wherever it needs to go, that would most certainly force them into the hands of the Iranians and they would increase their, their, uh, their role there. So I, I think ensuring that we remain engaged in a significant capacity as we are now uh, is important towards the long-term goal of ensuring that Iraq does not become a puppet state or, or, or a rump state that responds to Tehran. I'm sure you saw the op-ed that Masroor Barzani wrote in uh, the Washington Post calling for a Kurdish... I think it ran like the day after I met with him. He must have written it before, though. <laughs> so what's your, uh, uh, what's, your, what's your position on that? Should we... Uh... Well, look, I, I understand his arguments. He makes a very compelling case. And I would say to you that if I were sitting in his chair, I'd make the same case he's making. And the reason why... And you press him back and say, well, you know, the administration's position is now is not the time for Kurdish independence, uh, and his argument is now is the perfect time. It's the only time we have any leverage, because once you don't need us anymore, you'll, you know, we've seen what happens, this has happened in the past. So I fully understand, um, and I don't, I don't think the concerns he raises are entirely illegitimate. Um, uh, I, I'm, when I'm overseas, I'm always reticent to take a position that runs contrary to the line that the government is following. I don't want to be in another country basically taking on the administration. It's, at least that's a tradition we've had here, which I guess has been broken now a couple of times. But, 
But I sympathize with the arguments that he makes, and I think it's something we should be open to exploring, especially if the ability to uh, create a unified Iraq continues to uh, you know, become more difficult. That said, I mean, that won't be easy either. Uh, there's, there, the first argument's going to be, all right, well, but who gets the, the oil fields? You know, who gets these vast mineral reserves that are critical to the wealth of the country? There'll be massive arguments about that as well. So, but I do sympathize. Donald Trump would say we should take them. We should take the oil fields for ourselves. Yeah, but 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 the thing is, that's not my position. Uh, <laughs> but but the but the thing is that um, you know I sympathize with the arguments he makes. I, I that's the argument I would make if I was in his position, and they're not illegitimate. Uh, the concerns he raises are not illegitimate, and I can I can tell you that our bills a different world from Baghdad just in terms of the level of security and stability. I, I wouldn't say it's perfect, but it most certainly is much more stable than what you see in Baghdad. And um, our alliance is with, the, with the Kurds is longstanding, and, and I, I think that means something. And I, I don't discard the arguments he makes. I think they're legitimate, and I think that's an important decision the next president will have to make. Whether I think the timing issue, though, is whether now is the time to do that is complicated, because it would to break away now would further make it difficult for uh, the Iraqi government to carry out its mission of defeating ISIS. We have, uh, you mentioned before the difficulty of, uh, of, of, of uh, clearing and then holding the, the Sunni areas that are, that are controlled by, uh, by ISIS. And it seems that we're, we're, we're working through a Shiite government in the south and, and, and Kurds in the north and the, the Sunni Arabs are, the, are, are, are left out. Do you have any recipe for how to uh, yeah, well, bring the Sunnis in? Well, I mean, the, the ISF forces are going to be the ones, we hope, that will make the ultimate incursion into Mosul uh, at, the, uh, at the right time. It could be a very apocalyptic showdown, and, and there is nowhere for ISIS to go. Um, there's no easy retreat line, and, and there's all indications that they're willing to die, as, make that their last stand. And if they do, it could be just catastrophic for the city in its aftermath. Uh, there is a Kurdish area of Mosul, which has to also be taken into account. And, of course, Mosul is the home of thousands and thousands of Christians who have had to leave. They'll have to have a future there as well. What I don't think is possible is that a Shia force could go into Mosul, take it, and hold it. I think that would be highly complicated uh, and, in fact, catastrophic, given the recent history of what's happened when Sh Shia moved into historically Sunni areas and other parts of the country. They have sought retribution against uh, Sunnis and other minorities in those cities, often accusing them of being collaborators and so forth. Um, so that would be a very interesting balancing act to see how that happens and, and when that advance ultimately happens here. And I know that, uh, that the preparations continue. Uh, again, uh, you know, I, I, think our ground, I think our armed forces have been helpful strategically in trying to lay the groundwork for that. But ultimately, it's going to be on Iraqis to go in and do that nothing, work. Nothing that we should do. We're doing it. In, I mean, no, it's in, independently of the of the Iraqi government. Well, ultimately, you can't. You've got to do it in conjunction with the forces that are ultimately going to move in. Right. And uh, and I think the Kurds will have a portion, a part to play in terms of cutting off supply lines to ISIS. I think, believe it or not, the, how the Shia militia comport themselves, because there's an argument they may use this as not as an opportunity to go and take Mosul, but as an opportunity to move even further north uh, and take other areas to the north of the country. Their argument now is that there's Turkish troops stationed up north, and so they need to go up and make sure they can counterbalance that. So they'll have a role to play somewhat in, in the periphery, but ultimately the responsibility of, of liberating Mosul will have to be on, in the hands of the Iraqi security forces, led primarily by Sunni forces, who are able to go in and hold that territory after it's liberated. So the president says we're going to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIS. Uh, how, uh, what would you, um, if, if that's the goal, um, how do you, um, uh, how, how would you rate our progress along that continuum? Well, we're making progress. As I told you, the defense, the military of the United States of America, you give them a task, they're going to do it. You tell them, go out and kill ISIS fighters. They will kill ISIS fighters. They do that every day. Uh, I think you can argue with the pace of it. There's, people would like to see more intensity, more assets committed to it. If they had more assets, they could do more, uh, more aircraft in particular. Uh, but, but we will... We, it will happen. That, the fundamental question, though, is radical Sunni Islam, this radicalization element, there will still be, if it's not ISIS, somebody else will step up and take their place as long as these basic ingredients are still there. Uh, Syria is a great example of it. As you can wipe ISIS out, Jabhat al-Nusra, 
or some other group will then rise up and take the mantle of that. And that will continue to be the case as long as Assad is in power and as long as sectarianism divides Iraq the way it does now. There will always be fertile ground for a new radical movement to, to emerge and to try to take advantage of it. Let's, uh, let's move to Turkey. You were also in Turkey. Um, and you mentioned that the, the Turks, um, uh, perhaps you mentioned it in the, in the conference from before, that the, the Turks are uh, looking at this conflict through the lens of their relations with the, with the Kurds. You would like to say a few words about that? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously the irritant in our relationship with Turkey is our relationship with the YPG, which they view as an offshoot of the PKK. And, and, um, and frankly, uh, that, that's been a major irritant in the relationship. The U.S. position and response is there's no one else to work with in the northern part of, of Syria. That's why we had to work with them. Uh, so th their primary challenge continues to be the PKK and the, what its activities within Turkey. Uh, related to it, secondarily, of course, they're worried about an increase of ISIS targeting into Turkey, which we've clearly seen an effort to terrorize. They're, they're trying to strike at Turkey's tourist sector uh, by hitting places where they believe Westerners congregate. And so that visitors won't visit, and they can hurt the country's economy. So there's, that's beginning to increase as a threat to them. But their fundamental challenge remains, and their fundamental focus remains, you know, the, the, their uh, conflict with the PKK and within Turkey itself, and what they view as their allies just south of their border. Their biggest fear, of course, is that the, the YPG will unify all the cantons across North Syria and then establish uh, an independent Kurdish state. Uh, right on their border, and from there just extrapolate that across the border into southern Syria as well. So that's what their 80% of their focus is on. Um, but, of course, they have a growing concern about ISIS and its involvement in, in attacks in, in, uh, in Istanbul and in Ankara recently. This is a problem that, uh, that I've lately been thinking a lot about, and, and, and frankly, I find it really vexing. Uh, because our forces on the ground are working with the, um, with the Kurds in Syria. Um, uh, but I fully understand the concerns of the Turks, and I fully uh, um, uh, and, and I believe that in the long run, in terms of putting this region together, we have to be working with uh, with Turkey. Um, so I wonder if you have any ideas about how to uh, how to uh, how to balance these commit these. Um, competing commitments? Well, I, look, I, I do think that long term, our relationship with the YPG could prove to be um, very, very complicated. I think that in the short term, we work with them in the north simply because that's who's there and that's who can control territory. Um, but in the long term, I think there's, there's the real chance that that could turn into a very difficult situation for us, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis our allies in Turkey. Um, how you put it together, look, the bottom line is that for, from their perspective, um, They've got to somehow figure their way through this issue that they have with the Kurdish representation in their own country. And in the absence of that, and with this continuing conflict against this group, the terrorist organization, as PKK is designated by the U.S. government, um, you know, it's, that's, that's an issue that I think is going to be going for a while. I'm not sure what role we can play in that. I'm sure we're not empowering them. But, um, but they're going to have to confront that uh, in, in the context of, of what's happening now in northern Syria and the concern they have that if they could unify the cantons, you could create this uh, uh, Kurdish state right at their border that, that p poses an incredible threat to them in losing territory to the southern part of their own country. Did you, did you hear any suggestions from them? Did they have any ideas uh, that you yeah, the, were constructive about how, to, uh, about how to balance this, or was it all just... Uh, no, not a lot of balance. I mean, they want to wipe the PKK out. And, and, so, and so they say their, their message to us was, was get the hell away from the Yeah, their, their message is we have, you know, Kurds are involved in the life of this country. They can run for, you know, they can be in office. They can participate. There's, they're, they're Turks. They're part of our country. But, uh, but they can't have this organization that blows things up, and they can't have this organization that sets up its own independent country. We're not going to let it happen. And uh, so they're going to continue their efforts against right. them. I think their primary concern is that we are empowering the YPG, which they view as simply a uh, name change of the PKK in, yeah. in northern Syria, that they'll be able to unify territory and from there use it as a base of operations against their interests. And, of course, the concern at that point is that you have an all-out war going on in northern Syria southern Turkey, between Turkey and those elements at the same time as all these other things are happening. What did the Turks say to you about the, the, about the fight against ISIS? Did they, uh, did they have any suggestions about, directly about that? You know, the generally, they, uh, they, there's a, obviously you've seen in the open source reports about their increased cooperation and assistance in taking that fight on. I think it's growing in importance given some of the, challenge, the, the strike attacks. There are always details that we can be improved on. 
and a lot of that we covered during the intelligence portion of my visit, but there are ways to improve upon it. But I think there's evidence that they see the growing threat of ISIS and they're dealing with it both from a domestic standpoint and ultimately in their willingness to, to do more uh, in, with regards to Syria. They also share this view that their primary, that they view, the way I can best describe it is they view ISIS as, yeah, yeah, something we've got to deal with now, but we're going to beat them. What about Assad? Right? And that's the same attitude you hear in multiple countries in the Middle East. There's not a lot of doubt that eventually ISIS is going to be defeated in terms of militarily. But then what? What comes next? And everyone's already, th th there was one thing that would categorize my visits is many of the players, if not all of them, have already, are already in the phase of thinking about what happens next the day after. and positioning themselves for what happens next in terms of Iran's ambitions in the region, in terms of successors to ISIS, in terms of the Kurds when it comes to Turkey, in terms of this, how do you unify Iraq, if that's even still possible, et cetera, et cetera. So, so if I could, if I could uh, sum, let, me, let me try to summarize your, what I just heard you say, and you can tell me if that's right or that's wrong, that uh, the implications for the United States um, are that we have to present to the players in the region a credible picture of the, of the order that will result from our military action in order to get the best cooperation from these players. Yeah, so what is the national interest in the United States? Big picture national interest is we do not want ungoverned, chaotic spaces in the world where terrorist organizations can train people, raise money, control territory, and use it to plot attacks against us or our interests and our allies around the world. That's our number one overriding interest. That's why all of this matters. That's why what happens in Syria matters. The reason why it matters to the U.S. national interest is because Syria the instability in Syria created an opening for a group, ISIS, to establish a foothold, attract foreign fighters, and now conduct external operations. The same is the concern with Iraq. Secondarily to that, or not secondarily, but associated with it, is our desire to see as much stability as possible because these countries, uh, as long as they're unstable, uh, they, they pose a number of other threats to us in, in the region, including you know, Iran's ambitions to spread, to, to create a sphere of influence that combines Iraq and, and and Syria with themselves, to, and, and increasingly Lebanon, to really uh, crowd out our allies in the region and, and, and impose the, the risk of escalation. But ultimately, for just from a pure, selfish, national security interest of the United States, we want to see stability in Syria and in Iraq, because in the absence of that stability, you are going to have radicalized groups who are going to be using it to stage and conduct external operations against the United States and its interests. So stability in, in, in Syria, do we achieve that by uh, trying to cut a deal with the Assad regime, or should we be sitting down with the Turks and talking about how to get rid of it? I honestly don't know how you cut a deal with the Assad regime. Uh, I don't think Assad can ever govern those their people in that country again. They, uh, not You've seen what's happened in Aleppo just in the last week and before that. The suffering, the human suffering, is, is just heartbreaking. The practical implications of it is there are seven, eight, nine-year-old children who are going to hate Bashar al-Assad and are going to spend the rest of their lives trying to get their hands on him and the people who helped him. This is the reality of what happens when you bomb a city and you kill a 9-year-old or a 10-year-old child's mother and father and or destroy their homes and steal their childhood. People don't forget this. That is never going away. That will always be there. And as long as Assad is there, Syria will be unstable. There is no way that Assad can ever govern that country again. So, uh, and it'd be stable. So uh, let, me, let me propose a hypothetical and bear with me. Suppose that you were vice president and you were playing a role kind of like uh, 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 Vice President Biden plays where he has a major role in uh, <laughs> dealing with the Turks and dealing with the, uh, uh, with the Iraqis. Uh, what would you propose to the president about the way, uh, the way forward, the, for the first step in order, to, uh, in order to move against Assad? Well, uh, that's a great question, and I think that's a difficult one at this stage because I think it would have been a little bit easier to deal with at the front end of it. I do think we need to, con and I mean front end, I mean in 2011 when I advocated that we should identify elements that we felt we could work with and empower them to become the most significant, well-equipped group on the ground. And in the app, because I warned that in the absence of that, that vacuum would be filled by other groups, and, and each country in that region would go their own way in terms of who to arm and train. That's kind of the direction it went. So now it's a little harder to do so. I still believe that we need to continue to empower elements that we can work with in Syria. And I believe there are elements that we can work with in Syria in a much more challenging environment in the hopes of eventually not forcing just Assad, but forcing all those who support him uh, to negotiate not just the exit of Assad, but the, 
the creation of some sort of transitional authority that can decide the future of that country. And I think it's a very legitimate question to ask whether that country, as we understand its boundaries today, will ever be able to be a unified country that way again, mm. given what's happened. Is it possible for that country to once again unify Sunnis, Shia, Christians, and others, given what's happened there, and Alawis, given what's happened there in the last five to seven years? That's an open question that will ultimately have to be determined by that transitional authority that should be representative. But you, you're, you're not going to get to that stage as long as Assad feels like he's winning. And after the Russian, it's interesting to note that before the Russians got engaged, Assad was losing. Now, he was losing to ISIS, but he was also losing to non-ISIS forces. And it was only after the, and it was, it, it was the, one of the reasons why the Russians engaged is because their fear that, in fact, that the regime was headed in an opposite direction, they would lose access to their, their warm water port. And, uh, and, and, and that's when they, because even the Iranian involvement was not enough to sustain him. And so I think the only way you're going to get people to the table and the establishment of a credible transitional authority is to increase U.S. support for elements on the ground that can actually threaten the Assad regime and, and force them to, to negotiate an exit. Uh, but r right now, those, uh, after the Russian engagement in the process, the tide of that war has changed, and Assad now doesn't, not only does he not see that day coming, he thinks he's going to win this thing. He thinks he's going to, even if he has to level Aleppo and everything else, he thinks he's going to win and at a minimum capture enough of that country to, to kind of take him back 10 years to where he was 10 years ago. Um, in a minute, I want to open it up to some questions from the, uh, uh, from the audience, but let me, say, let me switch uh, gears here a little bit. And uh, 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 you probably saw the, the David Samuels piece in the New York Times Magazine about, the, uh, about Ben Rhodes and, the, um, uh, and the, the, the campaign to push the... Uh, I kind of skimmed through it. I knew a lot of that already, but yeah. I kind of skimmed well, that's through it. Well, that that that's what I wanted to ask you. Is there, is there anything pretty shocking here to you about this? And, uh, no, I, I mean, look, I don't mean to be... I've met with Ben a couple times, saw him a couple weeks ago. I don't mean to be disrespectful. He's clearly a smart and intelligent person, but I don't... I don't when, for example, on the issue of Cuba, when you spend a speechwriter... To, when you send a speechwriter to negotiate with trained intelligence officers, you usually get a bad deal. And, and, uh, and I think that Cuba is an example of it. I think in the case of Iran, uh, he works ultimately for the president. The president wanted a deal. They did a deal, and Ben Rhodes figured out a way to sell it to the American public. Uh, I'm not sure that's the right way to make foreign policy, uh, but that's sort of the way the administration approached it, and, and uh, you know, obviously was effective at messaging to a certain extent because he got the result they wanted. But, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about foreign policy being written as a novel as opposed to uh, <laughs> kind of what's in the long-term interest of the United States. And, uh, but I made those arguments at the time. Right. I mean, I made the arguments at the time that this was the deal with Iran and, and the deal with Cuba was more about an additional exhibit at the Obama Presidential Library than it was about some stable foreign policy that could be sustained over the long term for different reasons. In the Iranian case, any understanding of Persian history, the history of the region, leads you to conclude that at some point they will seek a preponderant position over their neighbors, and the best way to do that in the 21st century is to be a nuclear power capable of striking nations all over the world. Once you reach that point, as North Korea learned, you become immune to international pressure. You know, there's not so much, they can't invade you, there's things they can't do to you anymore because you may hit them. And so that is, and on the issue of Cuba, it's unfortunate because I thought that we, had a, we were reaching a point of incredible leverage over the Cuban regime given the disaster that is Venezuela and the subsidies that are going to stop coming to at least get some political opening vis-a-vis -vis what you've seen begrudgingly slow, unfortunately, but with Burma. Uh, instead, the Cuban regime's now seeking a way to institutionalize this form of government they have and leave it permanent uh, for future generations of leaders or whatever. And, uh, and I think that the Obama deal with Cuba gave away much of the leverage that we had up to that point to kind of nudge it in the direction of more democracy. Uh, let me just ask you one more quick question on Israel, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to the, uh, to the, to the crowd here. Um, there's a lot of talk. Uh, about uh, uh, perhaps the United States supporting a Security Council resolution uh, most likely after the election, so it won't complicate Hillary uh, Clinton's chances, um, that would lay out uh, in the form of international law the parameters for uh, um, Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace 
Uh, I know the Israelis are concerned about this, uh, the pro-Israel community here is uh, concerned about it. Um, what's your view of the likelihood of that, and do you have any ideas about how we can stop it? Well, I don't know about the likelihood. It wouldn't surprise me. The administration has threatened it uh, on a number of occasions, uh, maybe not overtly, but, but in, in some of the language they've used. I don't think you can impose a solution. And quite frankly, I've said this before, I'm not sure that the conditions today exist for such a solution. I don't think they're in place. To begin with, I'm not sure Israel has a partner to negotiate with. There is no honor in the, in the Palestinian Authority's political circles to being the person that cuts a deal with Israel for peace. I think you're negotiating in the case of, uh, in some cases, of a unity government now with, with Hamas that has basically stated that their, object, that their purpose is the destruction of the Jewish state and its elimination. So it's very difficult to deal with people uh, who have stated that their goal is the destru is your destruction. So that, that, I think, is a – now, do I hope that there's a solution? Absolutely I do, and perhaps the conditions will exist at some point. So I think our goal now well, it should be, to, to the extent possible, to ensure you know, that, uh, that conditions are secure in that area, that, that the Palestinian people living in, hopefully in Gaza one day, but also in the, in the Judea-Samaria region, the West Bank, that they're able to uh, have some level of prosperity and security and, and upward mobility, and in the hopes that generationally there's some level of societal transition that will allow these people to live uh, with an understanding that right now seems impossible given what young children are taught at a very young age uh, about how glorious it is to kill Israelis and Jews. And so I, I just don't think that this, at this point the conditions exist for this grand deal. And I don't think the uh, international community can pressure Israel into it, nor do I think they should try. And in fact, I think it actually makes it worse. Right. Uh, because when you try to impose these conditions, it emboldens Israel's enemies to be even more daring in their attacks and in their attitude. All right. Well, thank you very much. Let's uh, now uh, uh, turn it over to the, uh, uh, to the audience. And there I see Nina Shea. Well, uh, could uh, everyone, when I uh, call on you, if you could just quickly give your name and your affiliation and then, uh, and then your question. Yeah. Hi. I'm Nina Shea, yes. a director of the Center for Religious Freedom here at Hudson. Thank you, Senator. Um, Two months ago, we saw a historic designation of genocide, of ongoing genocide from the Secretary of State um, on behalf of the Christians, Yazidis, and others at the hands of ISIS. And I want to thank you for your leadership on that issue, by the way, in, this, in the Senate. But it's been disappointing that the Secretary of State has been silent ever since. Um, and what should the next steps, next policy steps of the United States be specifically on behalf of these ISIS survivors, specifically those in Kurdistan, Iraqis in Kurdistan. Um, this is now dragging on to the third year. They're continuing to live as indigents. They have dire needs for uh, everything from housing to education, including college, to equal rights of citizenship, uh, land protection, and so forth. Well, first of all, it's important to point out that a, a tremendous amount of the financial burden of, of assisting these displaced people um, particularly Christians, and also Yazidis and other religious minorities have fallen disproportionately on Kurdistan, and they're, they're not just giving territory, but they're actually bearing the cost of it. So I think there needs to be more international cooperation led by the U.S. example from around the world has contributed, but they simply can't bring the same uh, efforts to bear as governments can. So I think that's critical. The second reason why that's critical, and, and you talk to people there, is because you don't want to see everybody leave. Uh, if they do, that means you're going to basically rob the area of its historical ties. Uh, these are, you want to see as many people as possible that have been displaced return to their uh, ancestral communities and rebuild them. So I think it's important to have a commitment from the Iraqi government and the governing authorities in these cities that, in fact, that's going to be allowed to happen and that their security forces are going to provide that space for them. So I think the financial assistance to dealing with the international displaced people led by the United States is critical in the short term uh, to the extent that there are individual cases of people that want to come to the United States or to the West. That should be facilitated as well, these Christians that are seeking uh, for reasons uh, to leave. But I think our ultimate goal should be to keep as many as possible in the region so they can return to their ancestral homelands and feel secure and with a chance of prosperity. Within that, uh, there are a growing number of Christians, young men, and, and, and some women who uh, aspire to join some of these uh, uh, popular mobilization forces. And I think that part of the long-term security, of course, is the ability for these Christian communities to feel empowered, that they have a role to play in their own self-defense. Um, uh, a 
again, this is not about arming religious militias, but by the same token, when you're the only people that aren't able to defend yourselves, you're, you're basically at the mercy of others' willingness to assist you. So I think it's a multifaceted, but the designation was important uh, because it calls attention to the reality of what they're facing. They're not just being evicted because bombs are going off. They're being targeted for death because of their religion. And so that designation was important. What hasn't followed is the assistance that should come with that designation, and that is the financial assistance to care for them in the short term in the hopes not just of carrying out our humanitarian function, but also keeping as many Christians as possible in the region so they can return to their ancestral homelands and reestablish these uh, ancient communities. Uh, we'd hate to see that eliminated. We've already, even before this conflict, saw a significant amount of Christians leaving Iraq and other parts of the region, and that would be, I think, uh, uh, unfortunate if that, were, that trend were to continue in the aftermath of this. Uh, there's a gentleman in the back that is very eager to ask a question. Yes, sir. Thank you for your time. Rahim Rashidi with Kurdistan TV. A couple of weeks ago, you were in Kurdistan. Uh, can you please tell us what do the Kurds need right now? And, of course, you know President Barzani decided for a referendum. If Kurdistan will be a state, how important is it for the stability in the region? Do you think Kurdish states should be supported by United States and Ally. Thank you. Well, yeah, I can tell you what I know Kurdistan wants, and that is to be more directly funded as opposed to having their defense needs have to run through Baghdad. And, uh, and, and they make uh, a compelling case for the need for that. Um, you know, I, 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 am, I have generally been someone in the past who has argued that I want to see Iraq remain unified and not partitioned. Um, that's been my position in the past. Um, I think that's a position that's worth re-examining given everything that's happened. I'm not prepared to say that I'm in favor of independence or whether some, you know, a more, more advanced confederacy type system. I don't know exactly how it would outlay, but I've already stated that uh, after our meetings uh, in Kurdistan, they clearly make a very compelling case for why it is that we should re-examine our position on that issue. I think the question is more one of timing. And that is the partitioning of Iraq or independence of Kurdistan at this moment, I think, would, would really be an additional irritant to a, an already complicated situation and already significant challenges that Baghdad faces in terms of presenting a unified front to take on ISIS. Um, obviously, the Kurdish authorities argue now is the perfect time to do it because they have maximum leverage in terms of that argument. So it's an argument I'm open to, to be honest with you, given what I've learned on that trip. I'm not prepared to endorse it at this time, but I'm certainly open to learning more about it. And I do think, irrespective of how this conflict ends, there is no doubt that more will need to be done to ensure that the people of Kurdistan feel like they have more autonomy and a greater role to play in their own security and in their own long-term uh, stability. David Hazoni. Hi, David Hazoni, editor of The Tower, and I work for the Israel Project. Um, we haven't heard a lot about Israel in the context of the Syrian theater. Of the what, I'm sorry? The Syrian conflict. Um, given that, from what, it, from what you said, it sounds like what you're saying is we're heading towards some kind of a non-unified Syrian resolution, if there's a resolution at all. Given that there will be some kind of division, um, would it not make sense to also include in any resolution, a recognition of Israel's presence in the Golan on a permanent basis, considering that the alternative would be almost unifying rhetorically the opponents to Israel and perpetuating conflict if we're already dividing it up, if we're already making it basically get, having there nobody for Israel to give the Golan Heights to because they wouldn't give it to a, you know, a Lawite, Stan, uh, Assad regime. They wouldn't give it to any of the other divisions. Wouldn't it make more sense for the U.S. to take a position that insists on including that in any kind of resolution? I think, and I, I, I've said that before. I mean, I think potentially that's exactly right. I mean, in the short term, the Golan isn't going anywhere. I mean, it is going to continue to be an important buffer for Israel, especially given what you now see on the ground. I think in the in the longer term, that's a that's a position that I'm also open to. Again, I, what I've tried to avoid doing is add additional irritants to an already difficult issue because it would almost give an argument. It would almost uh, be used by some of the forces in Syria as a 
call to additional arms on, with regards to what's happening and perhaps even trigger more activity near the Golan uh, at a time when Israel already faces multiple threats. But the reality of it is what you've stated, and that is even if Israel tomorrow decided we don't want the Golan anymore, who exactly would they turn it over to? Iran, since they basically control Damascus and the, and the Syrian regime. And uh, so I think that will most certainly have to be a part of the conversation. And my guess is that for the foreseeable future, Israel will continue to have an enduring presence in the Golan. And I think it's the, the, the wisdom of that has only increased since the instability in Syria has grown. It, it's a, it is a valuable buffer from that instability in the region. That, uh, and, and, of course, the, the, the bigger long-term threat to Israel beyond the Golan is uh, an enduring permanent Iranian presence in Syria that will allow them to conduct uh, an attack against Israel which it, that doesn't have to be launched from Iran, but could actually be launched from Syria itself. And the ability of the Syrian regime to protect itself from Israeli air forces uh, and, uh, and, and, and also, it would also be a, a significant uh, a, um, complicating factor if it extends all the way up into Iran as well. And these are the things Israel is watching every single day very carefully. But um, on the issue of the Golan, yeah, there is no one to turn it over to now, and I anticipate there's no pressure on Israel to turn it over to anyone right now because there's no one to turn it over to. I think as part of the final matrix in this, it's likelier than not that Syria, that the, the Golan Heights will remain in Israeli control for a long, long time. Jeff Anderson here. In the Senator, thank you for coming. Jeff Anderson with the Hudson Institute. What could... Uh, Donald Trump say potentially over say the next month or so that would reassure you about his ability to potentially handle the challenges that you've talked about today if he were to become president. Well, I don't. I wouldn't put it that way. I mean, look, my as I've said before, uh, you know, my, my policy differences and reservations about Donald's campaign are well established. I said them often, and I stand by those. Those remain, and. My, I hope they'll be addressed, but those remain. That said, I, I don't view myself as a guy who's going to sit here for the next six months taking shots at him. Uh, I, people know where I stand. They know how I feel. They know what our differences are. He's the nominee of the Republican Party or the presumptive nominee via the voters. I'm, I respect that and accept it. Um, but that's not going to change the reservations I have about his campaign or about some of the policies that he's established. Um, but I'm not insisting he change anything. I mean, he needs to be true to whoever he is and and uh, that's the things he believes in, and he'll make, have a chance to make that argument to the American people. I'm going to focus on making the arguments I think are important for the country uh, and, and right for our future and, and looking forward to supporting candidates around the country, especially for federal office, that share those views. Thank you. Um, Senator, you said that – Sorry, could you identify yourself? Sorry, Shoshana Bryan, Jewish Policy Center. You said that indigenous forces, local forces, ought to be in the lead in Iraq and in Syria um, to avoid some of the fallout of having us do the job for them. What if they're not capable? At what point does the United States either have to say, we're going to do it ourselves and we're going to do it big, or concede defeat in one of those two theaters? And if we concede defeat in Syria, do we concede defeat to the Russians? Well, that's a great question. I don't know what I would say would be about conceding defeat. I think it would just be basically freezing the conflict the way it exists now, perpetual for the foreseeable future, which I think is a negative outcome as well. Um, the bottom line is it is the only formula that works for, for a couple of reasons. Number one is we need to, it's one of the reasons why we need to revisit the defense sequester. On the, on the, on the pace that we are on now, um, an and operation of the scale required grows increasingly difficult year, in, year, year by year. We're putting an incredible strain on our reserve forces, incredible strain on our National Guard, incredible strain on uh, an aging military infrastructure that is not being replenished because of this ridiculous sequester uh, that does nothing to balance our budget but is undermining our defense options. The, my objections to a U.S. re-engagement on the ground in the region is I just don't, I don't think it solves the fundamental problem, and that is we could, yeah, we could go in with ground forces, and, which the American people won't support, and I don't think you should ever do anything that far outstrips public opinion of that nature uh, in a conflict such as this. But as soon as we move out, it's all going to start again because these local, local forces need to build the capacity. Uh, in the absence of that, I think the likelier outcome is that this situation that we now face in the region will continue in perpetuity. It will continue for an extended period of time. 
that instability. I don't, I don't think we would. I don't think you're going to see a Russian takeover of Syria or an Iranian takeover of all of Syria. But I, but I do think that you, what you'll see is what we see now on the ground, kind of be frozen. Uh, and by the way, I think that's actually one of the goals the Russians have. They're experts these days. Putin is at freezing conflicts and leaving it as it is. For him, it serves multiple purposes. As long as he can has an air presence and a naval presence there, and he's conducting airstrikes, he's at the table which gives them global statute, not commensurate with the size of their economy, and uh, which is basically the size of Italy's economy. And the second thing that it does is it distracts people from Ukraine, and it distracts people from other things that he's trying to carry out. So it's positioned them as a global player at, a, I wouldn't say a low cost, but certainly not an insurmountable cost. If this thing continues this way for the next 30 years, you know, for him, you're Putin, you're thinking, look, as long as there's a jihadist wonderland in Syria, that means all these people trying to kill us domestically, these jihadists, they're going to go down there to be a part of it. They're not going to be blowing things up from Chechnya or some other places. So he's played this out in multiple ways. So if he, if he categorizes that as victory, I suppose. But it's not that we don't – there are limits to American power and influence, and we can't impose on people the ideal outcome. Ultimately, they have to have the – capability to, to establishment and hold it for themselves. Uh, we can't be there in perpetuity every five years intervening every time this thing goes south. I think that we can help. We can provide an incredible assistance. And we can nudge and we can hope that ultimately leaders will emerge capable of providing that sort of leadership. But in the end, there can only be a stable Iraq and a stable Syria when there are stable Syrians and Iraqis governing them. And in the absence of that, there are limits to what we can do. And I want us to be engaged, but not without limit. I think we've got time for one more question here. Uh, yes, sir. We, got, uh, we promised to get Senator Rubio out at uh, 135, and we've got one minute. So if you can make it exceptionally okay. brief, I'd appreciate it. Thank you for coming, Senator. Uh, my name is Mitsuo Nakai. Uh, in the e Asia Pacific, we have a problem. Can you comment on the North Korea nuclear uh, issue we have? Yes, I'm against North Korean nuclear weapons. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there's a lesson to be learned from it, right? And that is you've got a country basically governed by a lunatic uh, who has, I mean, a certified lunatic. I don't, you know, but, and, and, um, and, uh, but he has nuclear weapons and in, an increased ability to project them long distances. And the result is he has some level of immunity that we fear is the path that Iran will eventually choose. Um, it's also very unpredictable in terms of what's happening internally. There's not a lot of transparency over what's happening internally in the country and whether there's any resistance. I just know a lot of people have been executed over the last couple of years um, and by his government, and I imagine it's primarily because they either posed a threat to him or, or disagreed with the direction he was going or who knows, maybe you know, looked at him the wrong way. I don't know. He's, he's nuts. So we have to deal with that reality, and I think the best way we can do it uh, in the short term is by increasingly committing to the, our missile defense capabilities in the region, working with South Korea, and that's why our commitment to our engagement. Now, again, during the presidential debate, there was an allusion made to the fact that South Korea is not doing enough. Well, that's just not true. South Korea contributes an extraordinary amount of money to our partnership and our presence in South Korea, um, and it's also valuable to the United States, but also the Japanese. I think it is a <coughs> promising development that they are now able to participate in collective self-defense because they're an incredible force multiplier. They have one of the most capable navies in the world. It's not normally viewed that way because people view Japan as a country that doesn't have an armed forces, but they do. Their navy is quite capable. And I think working with the Japanese, working with the South Koreans, uh, we can establish uh, the elements of missile defense capabilities that protect the U.S. homeland, Guam, Hawaii, but also South Korea and Japan from the threat posed by the unpredictability in North Korea. As far as seeing that the ideal goal everyone would like was a unified Korea governed by a government that looks like South Korea's, not North Korea's. I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure how we get there. These things have a tendency to one day happen because of something that happens internally. We just don't have a lot of insight into what it would take for something like that to happen. And uh, there's also evidence, you know, that the Chinese relationship with North Korea has altered within the last year and a half. Um, I think they're, they, they've always feared more than anything else. The biggest fear that China has is some sort of catastrophic meltdown in North Korea that would lead to a mass migration across the border. And so they've always valued stability in North Korea over anything about human rights or anything of this nature. I do think 
they also fear a unified North South uh, unified Korea and the the threat that could pose to their regional ambitions. But I think they've balanced that increasingly with a sense that uh, South, North Korea has become more trouble than it's worth these days in terms of their continually aggressive and abrasive behavior on the part of their leadership. So it's an interesting thing to bear watching to see exactly how China continues to view its relationship with North Korea in the years to come. They do have significant influence. I think it's sometimes overestimated by some. It is clear that uh, North Korea has, on occasion over the last couple of years, done things that runs counter to what China wanted them to do. Ultimately, the number one motivator in North Korea is regime uh, survival. And um, so I do think that China's influence over North Korea has limits. And there is evidence that in the last couple of years they've lost a little bit of patience with what's happening there. But I think it's tempered by their fear of a unified Korea and what it can mean as far as their global, as far as their regional ambitions for predominance and also the fear of a, a mass migration should the government there melt down. Well, uh, Senator Rubio, uh, as I mentioned to you, I think uh, you're among uh, the most articulate uh, spokesmen for the, the kind of internationalism that the Hudson Institute represents, and uh, we thank you for that. And uh, I'd like to turn to the audience now and um, ask you to uh, join me in thanking Senator Rubio for what was a very engaging discussion. Thank you very much.